a little less, a few less people here today because of the holidays and traveling and stuff like that. But um, hopefully the people who join us and there are, there are a group of people who religiously join us on, on, uh, on Facebook, interestingly. So um, there are people who are, and actually some of them came to Seder um, uh, Saturday night, which was really nice because it was the first time that I had met some of them uh, in person. So we have a few people that join us virtually and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get this out of here. So we hope everyone's been having a good Passover so far, a good, good and sweet Passover. Um, we had a, a great Seder. It was nice to have everybody together and to be able to do that in person again after a few years off. Rabbi, yes, um, your site. We light that Friday night. Yeah, yeah, Friday night, the last night of right. Okay, night of Passover. That's right. Well, let me Actually, do before sundown, though. That's over so far. Yeah. <laughs> but I brought back roots in case anybody oh in case anybody wants to hear okay. So there are good really good things about food and Passover. I don't know. I mean that's you complain a lot. Oh, a lot, a lot. I complain a lot. And uh, I will complain about macaroons too. But um, yeah, even the sweet stuff for Passover is marginal in my book. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm putting Mary in charge of, of macaroons. We're passing those around. Um, they're chocolate and there's, oh, those ones are just purely coconut. All right, well, <laughs> you can eat, you, if you want, you can eat my portion. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to like matzo, you know, so. You do? Yeah. Well, Mike was telling us just before you got here that he, he had um, wheat matzo without salt. Oh. Well, well, it's only normally wheat, but he had one, he, Mary found him one without salt. Which have even less taste. <laughs> I don't know what. I really don't know what that tastes like. So, we actually. I actually shared at Passover that one of the interesting things that the, the Torah tells us we're supposed to have matzah, and the the, the, wheat, the matzah without salt tastes like licking the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would think. So the Torah actually. Well, <laughs> the Dora tells us we're actually supposed to eat matzah, not just give up bread. It says we're supposed to give up bread, but it also says we're supposed to eat matzah. So the rabbis ask, why not just a prohibition about eating all bread? Why do you have to eat unleavened bread? You know, it should just be like Lent where you give up every, you know, all of it. And so they teach, the teaching from that is that it's easier the easy thing is to give something up, um, just to give it up altogether. The hard thing is, the challenge is to come into contact with something that's very close to what you're supposed to be doing and not do it. And that's what it is. It's about discipline. It's about controlling yourself. And that's a really interesting teaching because um, it is. It is the hardest part. If, if people just said, oh, we're giving it up. But it's, 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 it's coming into contact with it, knowing how close you are, 
and still, you know, making a decision to eat the right thing, not to, not to, or to eat the thing you're supposed to eat. Much about my life. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all, it's, it's, it's all of our lives. That's why, that's why we have these rules, uh, and these teachings. So, um, yeah. But again, the easier part is just giving it up. It's not, it's, that's not the, the challenge. And it is true. I mean, that's, that's true for anybody who's, you know, dealt with an addiction or especially an addiction to something that is something that you have all the time. Like people who have, you know, it's one thing for somebody to give up, you know, a narcotic or a drug that they're not supposed to be taking at all. The real, real challenge is when people have an addiction to food or to sex or to something that is healthy to engage in the rest of the time. And then you're like, and even to some extent, I mean, people can give up alcohol. You don't have to have alcohol to live. Um, but to give up, you know, to control or moderate food intake when you have a, when you have an eating disorder or a food addiction, that's really hard. That's, that's a daily struggle. So um, yeah, these are, you know, this, this is a, a acknowledgement that that's the, the real, the real challenge. So um, yeah, anyways, all, all of these things are a week, you know, this is a week. Shouldn't be that hard. Uh, how many more days do I have? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, well, it's actually been easier for us the last few years. I want to tell you, since we started eating rice, it's gotten a lot easier for us. I grew up never having rice. And then a couple of years ago when the, when the conservative movement gave in on rice and beans and legumes, and I always had, I always had peanut butter, peanut butter, you know, for some people would, they wouldn't eat peanut butter, but um eating rice. Oh, that opened up a whole bunch of possibilities. So, uh, you know, I've had sushi. I haven't had sushi yet, but I've had sushi in previous years. There's going to be a night where we're going to get sushi. Um, and you know, there's things like what the famous Passover Passover sushi. Yeah. (laughs) Passover sushi. Technically rice checks are, you know, you could have for breakfast. I mean, there's a whole bunch of rice stuff that, you know, uh, opens up right egg fried rice, that kind of stuff. So, um, but a lot of eggs and a lot of potatoes, potato. All right. So, uh, in honor of, in honor of Russia and Ukraine anyways. Uh, so last week, what we finished was with this amazing confrontation between Saul and his, I mean, uh, David and Saul's daughter, Michal. I just saw the word Saul and reminded me of Saul, but Michal and uh, David's confrontation after he danced with the ark as it came in and he, his last words to her were, you haven't seen anything yet. You think I was, you think I was making a fool of myself before? It's going to get worse. My celebration is not going to end. Um, and by the way, it doesn't even seem like he's necessarily talking about that day. Like maybe this is going to be his new behavior. Um and part of that behavior is going to be to some extent, or maybe it was Michal's choice too, that she's never going to have kids with him. Does that mean she never had sex with him again? Maybe. I, th- I think it's likely. But the bottom line is, is that he essentially keeps her captive or, or keeps control of her, or doesn't let her have a life outside of him. Um, you know, he brought her in and, and, uh, and kind of kept her in the palace. Um, it's a really, really weird relationship. And it's one that um, essentially gives us more questions than, than answers. Um, but it's one of the, the, it's one of the really bad things that, that David does. It's not maybe the, it's not the worst thing he does. And we sometimes don't talk about it, even in the scope of other things he does today, we're going to start with chapter seven and we're going to go probably to chapter 10 which is going to take us right up to the Bathsheba story, which a lot of people say is the worst thing that David does. Um, but today we are going to read some other stuff that he does that, that is um, interesting. Some of it is, uh, some of it is nice. Some of it seems calculated. And, uh, but there is a sense in this story that either the person who wrote it or edited it knew very well what happened and doesn't pull back punches to some extent from what happened. So let's take a look today as we continue to see David um, take control and uh, 
both uh, internally within his own domestic policies and also his international relations, if you will. So let's take a look. Rosemary, you want to okay. start us off? When the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had granted him safety from all the enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, here I am dwelling in a house of cedar while the ark of the Lord abides in a tent. Okay, so well, hold on one second. So pretty, pretty clear. I mean, the way he says it is, is very poetic and very powerful. Here I am in a palace and the ark and the tabernacle, etc., is still temporary structure. So I have a palace, but God doesn't have a palace. It's not right. So David says it's not right. It's kind of nice. It's a it's a it's a respectful and religious thing to say. Nathan said to the king, Go and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night. The word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and say to my servant, David, thus said the Lord, are you the one to build a house for me to dwell in? From the day that I brought the people of Israel out of Egypt to this day, I have not dwelt in a house, but have moved about in tent and tabernacle. As I moved about wherever the Israelites went, did I ever reproach any of the tribal leaders whom I appointed to care for my people Israel? Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Further, say thus to my servant David, thus said the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock to be ruler of my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut down all your enemies before you. Moreover, I will give you great renown like that of the greatest men on earth. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear a little Pippin in the background yeah, here. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. <laughs> I will establish a home for my people, Israel, and will plant them firm so that they shall dwell secure and shall tremble no more. Okay. Evil men shall not oppress them anymore as in the past. Ever since I appointed chieftains over my people, Israel, I will give you safety from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that he, the Lord, will establish a house for you. When your days are done and you lie with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own issue, and I will establish his kingship. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will chastise him with the rod of men and the affliction of mortals, but I will never withdraw my favor from him as I withdrew it from Saul, whom I removed to make room for you. Your house and your kingship shall ever be secure before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Wow. So that is what God's message is to King David through the prophet Nathan. Now, if you're wondering who Nathan is, that's a fair question, because we really haven't been introduced to him yet. We really don't know who he is, other than, as we just saw in this story, he's a prophet. He speaks to God, and he speaks to God as David's kind of intermediary, which is interesting, because, of course, it also begs the question, does, does God talk to David directly? But Nathan definitely has a role to play, and David's going to be very, uh, Nathan's going to be very key to David's story over the next uh, rest of the book of Samuel. Nathan, Nathan has a huge role to play. And some people say that the, the reason that he has such a big role to play is that somebody who followed him or knew him or was a scribe for him or was in his inner circle was the one who wrote this story. And so this story basically has Nathan delivering to David this key, very key piece of information, or several key pieces of information, but this great, it's not really soliloquy, this great message, which is you're going to, you're going to be king for a long time. Your children will be king after you. One of your descendants, one of your children will build the house for me that you talk about. You're not going to build the house for me. 
And at the very beginning, the speech begins with the reason. I don't need a house. I didn't need a house. And you didn't say how long, but it's been 200 years. They've been in the land through Joshua, through all the judges, through Saul, Samuel, and was well, a judge, but Samuel's time and Saul's time. For 200 years, they haven't had a house. God hasn't had a permanent structure. He says, I've been going wherever the people are. I, I, did, I, did I ask anybody? Or, Michael, it's great. It sounds great. Did I ask anybody to have, um, to have a house? I didn't. I don't need it. And so all of these pieces are part of the speech that God just gave um, that we have here, which is essentially, I mean, it's great news for David. Because David has, has been told maybe the most important thing that anyone can ever know, which is that your descendants will be okay. I mean, literally, what more do you have to hear after that? I mean, to some extent, if somebody told you you could go into the future, see the future, right? One of the main things that probably a lot of us would do I mean, I think I would do it. I mean, we want to see, hopefully see humanity made it, obviously, as a, a, in a general sense. But we'd probably want to see how our descendants are. Where, where are my descendants? Where, where are my people in this future world? So if you got to go 200, 300 years in the future, you'd want to see, hey, how are, how are my progeny doing? How are they faring in this world? What are they like? Do they have any of, do they remember me? Because to some extent, David's being told here, this is your legacy. This is your, this is, this is you. This is what you're going to do. And um, what's interesting, of course, is that this doesn't happen, really. It happens for a long time. The kingship of David, the Davidic dynasty, lasts 400 years. We're going to be reading about it all the way through the, books, the next two books of Kings. It's all about the Davidic dynasty. All these people are, are descendants of King David. Uh, but it's 400 years. It's 400 years. So his, his kingship comes to an end with the Babylonians, and the Babylonians exile the last king of, 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 of Judah, Zedekiah. They take him away. It's a, it's a horrible end to the kingship. But... Because this last line, Venem on uh this last line leads to everything else that comes about with Davidic, the, the, the messianic line of David. I mean, to some extent, there's no, there's no Christianity without this line, or at least some aspects to Jesus's legacy because Jesus being a descendant of King David and being part of that kingship that lasts forever and ever, Adolam, Lam, and it says it twice in the sentence, by the way, too. It's kind of a repetitive sentence. It doesn't really, <clears throat> it doesn't really, um, you don't see it as much in the English translation because the first time it says shall ever, and the last time is forever. But if you look in Hebrew, it says Adolam, Adolam, twice. So two times it says your, your house and your kingship will be forever. Your throne is the way they translate the, you know, the word kiset, which is a seat, but it's, you know, it's understood to be the seat, um, will be forever and ever. So... Uh, what what more can you say about this line other than to some extent david here at this time before you know kind of like not at the beginning of his kingship but pretty early on in his reign he's being told you're you you've got the greatest blessing of all time and it's initiated to some extent and you could kind of say well he didn't ask for that he wasn't, he wasn't saying, God, give me a blessing for my legacy forever and ever. The discussion started because he said he wanted to build God a house. 
So you could say that maybe that's the reward for his desire to build, to build God a house. Here, here, he's being told it won't be him. Now, I will tell you that so far, all it said is that you're not, it's not you, it's going to be somebody else. There are parts of the in the Bible that interesting is they carry the, um, the tabernacle around with them. The what? idea that God is everywhere. What? It's interesting as they carry the tabernacle with them, and it's the idea that God is everywhere. You know, everywhere they go, they, they take their God with them. He's yeah. not just in a house. He's, he's in this whole tabernacle. Yeah, there's, there's, there's an understanding here to some extent that God doesn't want that. Yeah. Right? Which, of course, you know, once you have a temple, you have a priesthood. You have, I mean, you, you always had priesthood, but now you have an established priesthood that has a house. They have a house, too. There's a place that can be destroyed to some extent. If it's, if it's portable, you can take it and, and run away with yeah. it. Once it's in a building, it can be destroyed. And then God's houses. There's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't build a house. But God does say, God does say, I will build a house. I will, I will, you know, he says, you know, your offspring, one of your own issue, um, he shall be, build a house for my name and I will establish his royal throne forever. God saying to David that your dynasty will last forever and ever. I wonder if that doesn't give David license just to do whatever he wants. As yeah. Yeah. It does it does call into question, you know, why we can do this with somebody who clearly has some has some weaknesses <laughs> and so if you tell man it's all going to be good like what if somebody told you that you know midway through your life man you don't have to worry about anything everything's going to be good you're going to have kids you're going to have a, a dynasty you're going to have whatever you'll be successful in your work whatever the equivalent is for you that everything you have that you want to have that you're going to have it, it's all going to be good it's weird because it would cause you maybe to do whatever you want and to maybe you do even take away your incentive to do anything. You're just like, I'm just going to let it play out. God said it was going to be good. Now, what of course is interesting is it's not easy for David. David's going to deal with some stuff in the next few chapters. And some of it is because of what he did. It's, 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 it's brought on by his decisions. It's not like independent of like, you couldn't say, well, it's just bad luck. God went against it. It does call into question how this plays out, whether whether David, um, knowing this, makes the rest of it any easier, right? Is, so, is there any rabbinical thought that, that once it, the temple is built in Jerusalem, that it significantly, negatively impacts Judaism? It's interesting you say that because the, by the time the rabbis were writing the Mishnah and, and the Gemara, at least with the, the end of the, the last ra generations of rabbis, Rabbi Akiva and stuff, they're writing and teaching after the temple is already destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now they want the temple to re be rebuilt. Don't get me wrong. It's not like, but that's the second temple. That's already a temple that they know, they, they know is a pale imitation of the original one. They don't, they're not in, were laboring under the illusion that God's presence was in that second temple. They don't believe that. They almost know that that, that was a model that was like, now well, this is the placeholder of where, and they, and they do the sacrifices or they, they do everything they're, they're supposed to do there, but they knew that God's presence wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew that it was a pale comparison, uh, a pale imitation of that. So, um. But there is this weird thing about the rabbis who, you know, they're, they're Pharisees. They don't really like the Sadducees. They don't really like the priests. But at the same time, they recognize that the temple had been ordered by God. It had been ordered to be constructed. And, and there are dimensions for it in the, in, in the book of Kings. We read about it at the very beginning of the book of Kings. We're going to read about Solomon making the temple. So clearly God at some point said, yeah, let's build it. So they, they know that there's like God at some point wanted to do it. And they, and, and, by that period, and, and literally we're talking about a thousand years of having a temple, with the exception of the 70 years between the Babylonians building it, uh, destroying it, and then the Persians letting them rebuild it, they have a temple for a thousand years. So the, the rabbis really still can't comprehend what a world would be like without a temple. 
it takes another few hundred years for people to say, well, maybe we, maybe the third temple will be something God makes that isn't exactly what like the last couple of temples were like. They start to talk about that. But the problem is they can't abandon it completely. And even today, Orthodox Jews can't abandon that. I mean, there's even a line in the Haggadah that we just read at Passover that says, you know, may, may we, it's actually part of the for, fourth blessing over the, over the wine. Let, it, let God rebuild our temples and so that we can eat our Passover sacrifice in there one day. We're like, I don't want that. Like I say that, and I'm like, if you want to, I always add like, eat that Passover sacrifice if you want to. But I, I, I mean, that's still part of the Haggadah. So can't abandon it completely. But there, it, you're right. There are these texts in here where it seems like God doesn't really want a temple. God doesn't, God seems to be a-okay with not having a permanent structure. So, you know, there's this idea too, that once you make one place holy, then people are willing to die and kill over it, right? And so this is another problem. This is, you know, if you can take God and God's everywhere and you can move God around, then I don't have to fight and die for this place. I mean, I don't need to tell you, there's people, a lot of people in the world that are both willing to die and kill for Jerusalem to this day. So this is not a this is not inconsequential for today for this very moment that we're living in right now. We saw like yesterday riots at the Al Aqsa Mosque. I mean, it's happening right now. I mean, Israel's trying to figure out: well, do we arrest people? Do we do that? You know, it's Ramadan still. You know, people don't know what to do. So I don't know. I, I can only tell you that 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 when we look at, at how this plays out over history, um, this last line that we just read, your house and your kingship shall ever be secure before you, that still becomes part of like our consciousness. And we, to this day, and we just did it at Passover, we opened the door for Elijah and we said, Eliyahu Anavi, Bim Heirav Yamenu, come speedily in our days. Imoshiach ben David with the Messiah, the son of David. I mean, we, we, we still part of our prayers. I mean, we have not gotten rid of this idea that God has promised to King David's descendants everlasting and everlasting connection. Uh, but again, it's been, as of today, roughly around today, it's been 2,500 years since a king that was a descendant of David sat on a throne in Jerusalem 2,500 years ago. That's a long time. It's a long time, 2,500 years. And we're still walking around with Moshiach ben David. So, um, I mean, I read this, I mean, I read this, this phrase, I mean, this is part of the, the, this verse is literally part of the Haftorah blessing that we do on Shabbat morning. I mean, it's all over our prayers. It's not, it's like, you, you gotta, yeah, I mean, you gotta understand that this is, this is still with us. And as you can see, on the other hand, God can withdraw that favor, which is what he did with Saul. But he says, I'm never gonna withdraw it from you. Which is also, again, gets back to that idea of like, see, so you're never going to, like, there's nothing I can do that will make me, that will make you withdraw from me. Like, I have no free will. Like, I can't do it. Maybe I'll push it. Maybe I'll see if I can make you pull it away from me. Because he does seem to do almost everything he can. All right. So this is uh, David's, David's words. But wait. So again, he, so far, this has been going back and forth through, Dave, through uh, Nathan, his prophet. So here's what happened. Nathan spoke to David in accordance with all these words and all this prophecy. Then King David came and sat before the Lord, and he said, What am I, O Lord God, and what is my family that you have brought me thus far? Yet even this, O Lord God, has seemed too little to you, for you have spoken of your servant's house also for the future. May that be the law for the people, O Lord God. What more can David say to you? You know your servant, O Lord God. For your word's sake and of your own accord, you have wrought this great thing and made it known to your servant. You are great indeed, O God, Lord God, 
There is none like you, and there is no other God but you, as we have always heard. And who is like your people, Israel, a unique nation on earth, whom God went and redeemed as his people, winning renown for himself and doing great and marvelous deeds for them and for your land, driving out nations and their gods before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt. You can see here is David's speech to God. And he's very, very humble in some way. You know, he says, you know, what am I? What is my family that you should do this for us? So you see a, a side of David here that is humble, that's respectful. Thank you. Grateful. And this phrase that he says to, to, to God here, uh, who is like your people Israel, a unique nation, Goya Chad. Uh, a Goya nation that is unique on the earth. Um, and here, a very appropriate to where we are right now. It, he says to him, who you redeemed from Egypt, that you took out of Egypt. So you can see that even for King David, the exodus from Egypt is this example of what God has done uh, for the Jewish people that is so special. It's not just that God has given them victories over their enemies and all those kinds of things, but that God actually redeemed them out of Egypt. That that redemption was part of what made the Jewish people uh, unique. In what sense do we use the word redeem? Well, the word that's used here, which is uh, padita, Asher padita, podet, means to redeem. It, it, yeah, but it's also to some extent, uh, it's to, to, when you redeem or, or ransom or pay bail for somebody to get them out of Egypt, you know, uh, uh, bail them out, uh, um, uh, ransom, you know, paid the ransom for. Well, that's interesting because the atonement theories are very riddled with that notion. Yeah, and here's God, you know, redeeming them. And, you know, we talk about God being the redeemer or the, sometimes we use the word ga'al, which means the, the root means, uh, it also, it's usually translated as redeemed. Um, but that has more of a sense of liberation, that God liberated. This is almost like paying the money to get you out, you know, uh, like, we have the pinyon haben when when a baby is thirty when a boy baby is thirty days old, the parents are supposed to redeem them from the kohanim. They're supposed to pay a fee for them. So that has the same root pinyon. This is padita. So it has a sense of essentially like buying out, you know, uh, you know, taking to some extent responsibility for paying the bail for, if you will. So, and then do the people owe God? Um, I think so. I think to some extent there's a sense of gratitude and appreciation, and and to some extent a debt that needs to be recognized that somebody redeemed you. Yeah, I think I, I think there is a sense. There's an owner. There's a sense that God owns you. That owns you. Yeah. Yeah. Rosemary? You have established your people Israel as your very own people forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. And now, O Lord God, fulfill your promise to your servant and his house forever, and do as you have promised. And may your name be glorified forever, in that men will say, the Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and may the house of your servant David be established before you. Yeah, so... Yeah, he's saying you're, you know, great God that did all these things, and may you be the, you know, it's it's the Adonai Tzvaot, which is the Lord of Hosts, the Lord of the Army, the Heavenly Army. We usually understand it as, but we're not really exactly sure what it means. Adonai Tzvaot seems to be uh, 
I mean, it's a weird title for God, if you think about it. The Lord of hosts, God over Israel. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very descriptive and long title for God, but Adonai's vote is the, 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 is the yud heh name, the Yahweh kind of name, right? That's what it is. But it's the Lord of hosts, and it's Adonai's vote. Uh, which is an understanding that it's like God and all the angels, all the angelic beings, all the other deities. And here it also says God over Israel. God, Elohim, which is the other name for God, which means God. And that's why it's translated as God, God over Israel, Elohim all Israel. So what's weird about that name, if you really look at it, um, is it doesn't really, if you think about it, if you look at his whole speech here, I mean, if you really look at this speech where he says, ki ain kamocha, the ain Elohim zuhula techa, which is like, you know, like ain kamocha is like, you know, what we say when we open up the ark. In Kamocha. If you look at what he really says here, David, uh, I, I will throw out this idea that other people have said when they really like kind of look at it and just like look at it without interpreting and trying to make it fit into something there's really nothing in this wonderful speech that he just gave to god that indicates that there really are no other gods what really almost seems to be in this speech is not hey of course you're god there's only you and there's just god everything's god there's no other god it doesn't seem like that's going on in his speech because what he says is there is no god like you there is no other God but you, as we have always heard. But that's to us, not necessarily to, I mean, if you really read the, the way it reads in Hebrew, is there is no God like you. And he says to him, God went and redeemed. What other person has a, what other people has a God like that? And it says that you drove out other gods before your people, which doesn't say that they didn't exist. He just says you beat all of them. And all those other gods were powerless in Egypt. It doesn't say they weren't, we weren't there. It doesn't say those gods were false gods or those gods were not real. And it says you have become their god which means like there were other gods and you became their God. And so there's a relationship here with this God, Adonai Tzvaot Elohim Al Yisrael, but there isn't really a sense here yet, I don't think, and other people who've read this before, that David's actually saying, yeah, but there's no other gods. Just there's no other gods for us. We're, we're your God and you're our God and we're your people and this idea that we have, but not necessarily if there aren't other gods. There's just no other God for us. There's no other God that's maybe as good as you, but not that there are no gods. There doesn't really seem to be this in there. And maybe one could argue, not only is it doesn't say that, it seems to imply that there are other gods by what he's saying. So I will tell you, that's a little bit of a problem for people who want to establish when did Jews actually believe there's only one God. So there definitely seems to be this understanding that God is, Adonai Tzvahot is our God, or at least David wants that to be the case. He only wants people to worship that God. And he is the God for us. And there is no other God that we're supposed to be worshiping, but that God. Now that by itself could be a fairly revolutionary idea, by the way, too. The idea that we're only worshiping one God, that every other God is out is by itself a pretty wild idea and not one that necessarily went over very well with the rest of the people who really at the time still really liked the idea that God had a wife. 
and the guy has kids. And they really are like, why are you trying to push this idea that there's only one God? And even the title Adonai's Tzvot doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other gods there. It's just that this God is the one who's in charge of all the other gods or all the other angels or everything else that's out there. But the word Tzvot pretty much implies other things, a host, which is why it translates as a host. And look, we don't talk about what a host is. We don't talk about that because we just hear the word host and it sounds like, oh, is that like the guy who has everybody come to their party? No, it's not that word at all. It's the host of an army. It's the host of an angelic division, as we call it. Even that word doesn't sound good because what's a division? It's like, oh, you do math? No, it's a, it's a general talking to his army and saying, this is my teva. This is my division. Guess what? That's what the Israeli army is called right now. It's called Tseva. It's a division. Sahal is literally, the Israeli army is called Israel Defense Forces. The forces part is Tseva. So the, the word Tseva means army. So we don't translate it as that. Everyone likes the word hosts. But the Lord of the army or the Lord of the angelic army the heavenly army the lord of the heavenly division that's what it should say we just don't we just don't do that that's what the word means so this is this binding together that david has with with god um it's all good i'm not saying it's wrong but he's also as you notice talking to god directly he's not talking to god through nathan so let's keep going it's not done because you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have revealed to your servant that you will build a, a house for him, your servant has ventured to offer this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God and your words will surely come true. And you have made this gracious promise to your servant. Be pleased, therefore, to bless your servant's house, that it abide before you forever, for you, O Lord God, have spoken. May your servant's house be blessed forever by your blessing. Yeah, and so then we get to this piece that seems pretty pretty important, which is that, and we really like you, God, and God, you do great things, and all this stuff is great, and do what you promised. Make sure that my house always stays in power. <laughs> Just do that part, because you said that. You said you're doing that. Make sure that that happens, that we're there forever forever and it uses the word forever a couple times again leolam leolam again there make sure that your servant's house is blessed keep my house going so that is david's discussion and response to god look it's a beautiful exchange on some levels because again david is told you're not going to be the one to build my temple. Maybe you wanted to. I get it. It's very nice of you. You can say God's saying you don't have to. And you know what? Don't worry about it. We've got you covered. God's saying, you don't have to give me anything. I'm going to bless you. Your house is going to be fine. Everything's going to be good. You don't have to build me a house. We'll build the house. We'll get to that. You won't do it. But everything's good. And that's what it ends with. But David's saying, God, you promised. So that is uh, David kind of saying to God, I've got your word. I've got your word on this. So a very nice uh, ending to that for David. Now we're going to see what David does with this knowledge that he has been blessed. Sometime afterward. David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Meteg Amah from the Philistines. He also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground and he measured them off with a cord. He measured out two lengths of cord for those who were to be put to death and one length for those to be spared. And the Moabites became tributary vassals of David. So let's talk about that for a second. So. He went to war against the Philistines, who he used to be allied with, right? The Philistines didn't trust him, or at least everybody but the king of Gath 
didn't trust him and they had a good reason to because once he became powerful enough he started beating them so their hope that somehow he would be good for them betting on this guy would be good for them you know doesn't seem to work now by the way there is seems to be some philistines that he's okay with maybe the philistines that took him in took good care of him right it does seem to be some philistines that don't suffer his wrath but he, okay he's we've already read last week we read about him attacking the philistines and he went to war against them and did great so he's he's remember philistines had, had made incursions into Judea, had made incursions even into Israel proper. From the coast, they'd gone all the way up into the north, right? That's where they defeat Saul, at Mount Gilboa in the Galilee. So, so he's turning back the Philistines. And it says here that he goes against the Moabites, who are on the other side of the Jordan River. Maybe they were also making incursions into our territory. And it, this weird ritual that he does where he measures out a cord and, and kills two-thirds of them and spares a third. It's kind of weird. Um, there is a, you know, there's kind of like this understanding that he he doomed twice the number that he spared, which is another way of saying he killed two thirds of them and he spared a third. A little math problem. A little. Maybe this is the critical race math problem that they had in the florida textbook <laughs> Text, no the, the ones that the florida people had a problem with in the math textbook maybe this is the problem no that's a good question because this one's pretty problematic because king david just wiped out two-thirds of the moabites but he spared a third of them yeah. that just for a second just step back for a second okay people do you, do you find anything weird about this he, now again he makes some tribute to terry vessel vassal so you know they have to pay him and they have to pay taxes uh he just killed according to this two-thirds of these moabites though anybody want to comment on that anybody, anybody want to throw out any weird things about his own background it's just weird the way he measured it out with the rope okay like but i'm going to ask you something Gail, because you know this I'm just, that's why i'm kind of fishing for this question is it weird that he killed two thirds of the Moabites? Actually, wasn't it? Uh, no, maybe I'm wrong. I was just thinking. No, you're not wrong. <laughs> His well, grandmother was a Moabite. That's right. It's exactly what I was going to say. Wasn't he? His grandmother's Ruth, a Moabite. Yeah, that's right. And in honor of her, maybe he spared a third of them? I don't know. <laughs> But this is a guy who, according to the Bible, is a third mo as a quarter Moabite. It's a quarter? No, it's a 16th. He's a 16th. Mo no, yeah, 16th. He's one 16th Moabite, according to the Bible. Yeah. What it says, the Bible says in the book of Ruth that his great grandmother was Ruth, right? David's great grandmother's Ruth. Boaz. That's how they became. That's Ruth moved to Bethlehem, right? And that's how she became. <laughs> He just killed two thirds of his own ancestry people. So his own whatever background, whatever his own ancestors, I don't know, whatever you want to call him. It's a weird story. It's a weird story. And uh, it's, I don't know what you make out of that. Is this something he did that was that like this, this is the way he dealt with people that he went to war with? I don't think the story is so weird. The cords are weird. <laughs> the cords, measuring out the cords. Uh, I, we don't know. It's the only time we ever see it. Measuring out cords to to uh, to kill people. Um, uh, the the conclusion is is that he spared one third of the people. Um, one third of the one third of the Moabites. At least enough left so he can keep them as as people that are going to give him tribute. He's not done. So the Moabites are, are remember, our descendants of, of Lot. So they're, they're from Abraham's, they're, they're distant cousins, if you will. They're through at least the line of Terach, of, of, uh, of uh, Abraham's you know, nephew Lot. And through Terach, they have a common, we have a common ancestor. Remember, the Ammonites are the other people. Those are the ones that Lot's daughters, Lot's daughters got him pregnant. Uh, got impregnated by their father and had Moabites and the Ammonites. 
Next people are in Aram, in the nation of, in the in modern area of Syria. Let's read about these guys. David defeated Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Tobah, who was then on his way to restore his monument at the Euphrates River. David captured 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers of his force, and David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except for 100, which he retained. Yeah, so people who like horses just got pretty sickened by that because uh, he just he just maimed a whole lot of horses so that they couldn't be used, of course, as soldiers, as chariot, you know, for, for our war, right? So the argument is, is that this is the only way he can make sure the people of Zobah, which is, again, in modern-day Syria, can't go to war against them. So he captures these, these soldiers and, and uh, captures their chariots, uh, or at least their chariot, hor the horses for the chariots. And he, uh, he, he basically leaves them with enough horses so that they can maybe do some farming, but they're not going to be going to war. He lost all those, those chariots and all those cavalry. So that's, again, in Zobah, up in the northern area. So here's what happens when that happens. And when the Arameans of Damascus came to the aid of King Hadadezer of Tobah, David struck down 22,000 of the Arameans. David stationed garrisons in Aram of Damascus and the Arameans became tributary vassals of David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Yep. So it says the Arameans came to the aid of one of their own. So the Arameans, at least who lived in uh, Damascus, which is, of course, the capital of Syria today, <laughs> they come to the aid of King Hadadezer. And uh, we're going to read about this King Hadadezer and his descendants. I, they, they they come back into the Bible, but um, this is pretty big. I mean, that David also took control of over Aram, over Syria, all the way up to Damascus, which isn't that far away from Israel. It's only about forty miles from the Golan Heights, but he went all the way up there, and he got he didn't conquer it. He didn't he didn't um, he didn't make it part of his kingdom, but he made them trip. He he made them vassals. He made them pay taxes and pay tribute. So this is ext extending and expanding his borders or his sphere of influence. So either he's, you know, going to take back territory like he did with the Philistines where he actually takes back the places, or he just makes sure that these people can't go to war against them anymore and he has control over them. So this is pretty big. It goes all the way up to the Euphrates River, all the way up to modern, through modern day Syria. David took the gold shields carried by Hadadezer's retinue and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Beta and Baratai, towns of Hadadezer, King David took a vast amount of copper. Uh huh. So you, you get wealthy by conquering people, hopefully. Part of, the, part of the reason you do it is not just to kill people, but to add to your coffers, if you will. But also, of course, to send a message to other people which is what happens now. When King Toei of Hamat heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadadezer, Toei sent his son Yoram to King David to greet him and to congratulate him on his military victory over Hadadezer, for Hadadezer had been at war with Toei. Yoram brought with him objects of silver, gold, and copper. King David dedicated these to the Lord, along with the other silver and gold that he dedicated, taken from all the nations he had conquered, from Edom, Moab, and Ammon, from the Philistines and the Amalekites, and from the plunder of Hadadezer, son of Rohab, king of Zobah. Yeah, and so again, to give people a quick uh, understanding of what we're looking at as far as the um, as far as the as far as the map goes so so this is Israel proper Canaan and 
all the tribe areas. This is when Joshua came in. But you can see the Philistines are down here. This is all area that, you know, part of the tribal area. And then we go all the way up here to Damascus. Then he goes here to Ammon. And he goes down to Moab. And he goes down to Edom. So his his kingdom kind of expands, in, in at least in control, all the way over to here. So if we if we uh, show what this looks like, it would be all of this territory now too. So this area is all is all going to be um, actually. If you think about it, it, goes all the way up to here. It goes all the way up to Damascus. It goes even further north. So it's a pretty it's a pretty uh, large territory. It also gives David a huge buffer, so he doesn't have to worry about these countries, these nations, attacking him. So this is also a way for him to. Um, it's also a way for him to uh, not have to have um, people on his borders who can attack him. So he winds up with a lot of a lot of spoil, a lot of plunder, uh, stuff that he had taken from these other nations and the people that he conquered. We're David done. gained fame when he returned from defeating a dome in the Valley of Salt, 18,000 in all. He stationed garrisons in a dome. He stationed garrisons in all of a dome. And all the Edomites became vassals of David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigned over all Israel, and David executed true justice among all his people. So if you look, it says, um, there seems to be a repetition of this phrase, he stationed garrisons. Um, it seems to be a, a scribal error is what they're essentially saying, because in, in Chronicles, when we read another version of this, it doesn't have that first phrase, but all the Edomites became vassals as well. So again, you have Ammon, Moab, and then Edom. That's all modern day Jordan today. So he doesn't make it part of his country, but he puts garrisons in there. He stations armies there. He makes sure that they're paying tribute. And this is not just control over his own nation, but over the nations that border him. So he basically creates the situation where it's not an empire, but it is a situation for Israel where they don't have to worry about their neighbors waging war against them anymore. And to some extent, they're paying them tribute with the, with the understanding that, look, we're not going to, we're not going to defeat you. We're not going to, we don't have to send armies here. And uh, you don't have to worry about rebuilding or us, you know, going to war against you or killing your kids or killing your, 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 your husbands. But in order for us to have this, situation you got to pay us which is what tribute is which is what he did i mean today you know it's not we wouldn't call it extortion but it's kind of the way people did things in those days when they came to their uh rivals and to places that were nearby that they were more powerful than so this is the way israel exercises power so they don't have to go to war so when David is done, his hope is he can pass this on to his descendants, this kind of kingdom that is strong, that has vassals that, you know, owe them allegiance. And of course, those kings are going to go, I don't want to do this anymore. And especially when like a king would die, they'd say, you know what, we're not paying that anymore. You know, when there'd be transfers and in, in transitions in the place that they were paying or as we're about to see, when there's transitions in leadership in those countries. So if a new king comes up and says, I'm not paying that stuff that my dad paid. Are you kidding me? Let him come and try to attack us. I'm much more powerful than my dad was. I don't need to, I need to pay a tribute. I can extort for me. That's what we're going to see happen. 
well, first we're going to get a little description of, we have a couple lines about who Jacob, I mean, who David's crew was. Here we go. Yoah, son of Zeruiah, was commander of the army. Jehoshaphat, son of Alihud, was recorder. Sadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Aviatar, were priests. Sareah was scribe. Benaiah, son of Yehoiada, was commander of the Karatites and the Pelatites, and David's sons were priests. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second, because those are some weird stuff, weird lines. There's so many weird things in here, but we're going to just, we'll look at them. We'll look at at least some of them. One is, that's a mistake. That's just a flat out mistake. Because his name was, his name was Abiatar, son of Ahimelech. They just reversed it. It was reversed. It's a scribal error. We read about him. That was the only priest, remember, who survived when Saul came into the place where David had been and said, where's David? No, oh, he's not here. Well, let's kill everybody. Those were the priests of No that Saul killed on a rampage when he was looking for David. Abiathar, if you remember, was the only one who lived. Well, he's still David's priest. Now, there's another priest named Tzadok, who's also part of David's priestly crew. Now, this is interesting because it says David's sons were priests. You can't just make your sons priests. Priests are supposed to be from the Kohanim. You can't just make a guy a priest. I don't know. David was the king. As they say, it's good to be the king. His, his sons, it says, it says, B'nai David, Kohanim Hayu. That's what, just, that's what it says. Made a priest. It's, it's like people don't know what to do with that line because it basically just says that David did whatever he wanted to. When it came to that, he was like, oh, my sons are going to be priests. I don't know what to tell you other than that doesn't seem to be what you're supposed to do. Uh, okay, so that's a couple things. But that's not all. So we see that there is Yoav, commander of the army. Jehoshaphat is uh, a recorder, right? He's some kind of, uh, you know, chancellor, some kind of important job of, of taking down, you know, information, you know, the, it's a pretty important job. I mean, look, we only know Jehoshaphat because we say jump in Jehoshaphat, but there was actually a king later on named Jehoshaphat. One of the descendants of King David is Jehoshaphat. Um, Jehoshaphat is just a, a really, you know, totally legit name, which means God is my judge. It's a nice name. Shaphat is a judge, Shoftim. Yeho is, is the yud hey vav hey name. God is my Lord, the Lord is my judge. So Yoav is the chief of the army, but Benaiah is the commander of the Cherethites and the Pelethites, the Kratim, the Krati and the Plati. Now, what is that? What is this? Because it seems like there was an army and then there was another army. Because it definitely seems like it's the word that's used there, um, or the way it's used there, and what we know about Benaiah later on, is that he was like, there was another army. Which was not the people's army or the army that people got called into, but there seems to have been another force that was maintained by King David a Praetorian guard, if you will, or a inner circle army, or a mercenary army, or some kind of army that David could have around him that would protect him. Look, it's not, it's not what we're used to in America necessarily, though I will tell you that we do have a branch of the military that thinks of themselves as this. They're called the Marines, and they pride themselves on being the president's army. Um, seriously, I mean, they, they actually take pride in the fact that they can get thrown into a, a military engagement without, you know, going to Congress, if you will. Um, though nowadays, it seems like everybody can get sent into battle without congressional authorization. But um, 
this was a big deal to have an inner army because number one, it shows a level of power that you can essentially create your own army that's always there. That's not called up in a militia, like a militia that's called up in a time of war, but you have a professional kind of um, force that's with you. First of all, it shows that you feel you need to have that kind of force, right? You need to have a, a group like that. And uh, it also creates a tension between <clears throat> the army and then this own private army. And this happens. I mean, there, there was, you know, rival armies sometimes uh, go to war against each other. It happened in the Roman Empire all the time where legions were led by one guy and he wanted to take power and he'd go to war against whoever was the emperor or whatever. And they would just go off and start battling for, for power. So this is not always a really great thing to have. And we're going to actually see that this is maybe the, the basis for some of the tension that happens later on in, in King David's own family is you've essentially established two armies. You, D David did it. It wasn't like somebody else established an army. He established an army. He had an army. And then he had another army of the Cree team and the, and the Plati. So we really don't know like what made him do this other than, Hey, it makes sense if he's, you know, wanting to have a, a special army that he can rely on and that he can count on. I mean, to some extent, you know, this is what the tension was in the German army between the SS and the, and the, you know, and the Wehrmacht. I mean, there, there, there was actually another German army for a little while called the SA until the SS killed them all in the long, night of the long knives. Um, when you get these kind of little armies, you know, that, that work for the, at the will of a president or a, or, or a tyrant or a king, or, you know, uh, they're oftentimes, or you're literally creating internal rivalries for, for power, for inner power. There's another issue too, which is where these people came from. Um, we don't know. We don't know where they came from. There are theories about where they came from. I've heard lots of theories about where they came from. Uh, but they probably weren't Israelite. They probably weren't Jewish. They probably weren't from the tribes. Which is even more amazing that David had his own inner army that was not part of a tribe. Which is even more indicative of this idea that he needed to have his own inner army to protect him because he didn't trust even his own people or maybe even his own family or maybe even his own tribe. Yoav is from his tribe. Yoav is from his family. Yoav is his cousin. But we're going to see that Yoav is not someone Well, we already saw that he doesn't trust Yoav because he saw Yoav kill Avner. So he already doesn't trust Yoav that much. We're going to see other reasons why he has a problem with Yoav. But who these Carathites and Plati, Pelathites, I will tell you that the overwhelming evidence based on the name and based on logic and based on what seems to be happening here, these mercenaries that he has, and I would call them mercenaries because they're soldiers for hire and they're in his employ, his personal employ, they're Philistines. Platim is probably a version of the word Plishtim and the Philistines. And Krati is probably a further indication of what kind of Philistines they are in particular. Because the theory, and I'm pretty sure where the Philistines came from, they came from the Aegean. They came from Greek islands. In one of the islands that we be what the Bible says they come from is Kaftor. One of the other places that's listed there too is. It's, it's really interesting. If, if you've seen like on the temples on, in um, Egypt, when they talk about the Philistines, they have these feathered um, caps. Yeah. They have feathered hats. Right. Yeah, I never saw feathers on anybody else. Yeah. So they have a very distinctive headgear and I'll show you a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, the Kratim, 
Does it sound like any place that you've heard of in the Aegean Crete. or the Mediterranean? Crete. What? Crete. Yeah. yeah. It's Crete. Yeah. So these are probably, <laughs> it's not, say they're Cretans. <laughs> they're from Crete. <laughs> I think I, Cretans will always have to deal with that now. But um, uh, yeah, these are these are these are Philistines that have made it into the inner circle of. Um, they've made it into the inner circle of, of David's inner circle, if you will. Um, so let me show you a good picture of what uh, Gail is referencing. Um, here's a here's a uh, here's a colorful here's a color a colored version of it. This is the feathered hats that she's talking about. Oh yeah, Philistines. Uh, here's a here's what it looks like actually on the walls of Egypt. Okay, this is the interesting thing. The picture you have on the left. Do you notice that the one face of the Philistine is facing us forward? Yeah. It's not the Egyptian style, but the artwork where they got ideas from the Philistines too. See, the artwork is a little different. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's, yeah, that's, that's Egyptian. Yeah. The rest of the side views is all Egyptian, but the one front on face means that their, their idea, their artwork is changing. They're exchanging some culture. So the Philistines uh, made an impression on the Egyptians as good soldiers as well so the fact that david would hire them as his own soldiers is not surprising but we don't know for sure but it seems as though that's the most likely answer of who these crot team and plea team are they're philistine mercenaries or philistine bodyguards if you will i didn't use that word until just now but i think that's what they were i think they were bodyguards and you don't really have to have bodyguards unless you have people that you're worried that are going to kill you. So I think you can see that David is worried that people are going to kill him. The question of when did David start to be paranoid is a fair question to ask. Was this written kind of like later on in his life and like just put in to kind of establish what was going on with him? We get to a point where David has a very good reason to be paranoid. David seems to be paranoid the whole time. But was that a projection backwards or was he always like that? Because as we saw over and over again, when he talked about Saul, he's like, you can't kill the king. Well, <laughs> you can't kill that king or you can't kill any king, meaning you can't kill David because he seems to be obsessed with that idea that, man, if you can kill Saul, then you can definitely kill David. It definitely is an, a theme in David's life, which is he is worried that someone is going to kill him. And when we see how his life plays out in the coming chapters, you'll understand why he felt that way. I'm not going to ruin the story for you by telling you that one of his own children tries to kill him. That will mess your mind up. Well, here's the weird thing, Reverend Lynn, is you're right, is that he was told that his legacy would be there. But here's the weird thing. If you're told that your children, your descendants will be on the throne for you ever and ever and ever. But what about me? So there's a very fine line between, yeah, I know that my descendants are going to be, maybe they're going to try to get on a little earlier than I'd like them to, meaning, well, I should still be alive. And so this is part of the problem with David's, like, like David's, David gets this great information that he's, that he's, that his descendants are going to be kings forever, but how long do I get to be king for? And there really does seem to be this tension that David has where, yeah, like on one hand, I, I want to know that like the big thing is my legacy is assured, but there's another thing where David just wants to live. And I think that that's a kind of a cool, real human thing that, that the Bible gave us, which is that David um, is a little concerned with his own skin. And aren't we all? I mean, as much as we want our descendants to be successful, we'd like to. Some of us are more concerned than others. 
and some of us have good reason to be, right? You're not paranoid until the, you know, right? If the people are really trying to kill you, you're not paranoid. So here's, the, we're going to finish with this scene today, or this chapter, um, which is uh, a really interesting chapter of Mephi Bochet coming back into the picture. Uh, and this weird, why does David do this? So let's, let's look at this uh, interesting let me check with the Saul's family. Here we go. So as much as we get to his own legacy, he's thinking about, well, what about Saul's legacy? What's going on with Saul's legacy? So here's what happens. David inquired, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul with whom I can keep faith for the sake of Jonathan? There was a servant of the house of Saul named Ziba, and they summoned him to David. Are you Ziba? The king asked him. Yes, sir, he replied. The king continued, is there anyone at all left of the house of Saul with whom I can keep faith as pledged before God? Ziva answered the king, yes, there is still a son of Jonathan whose feet are crippled. The conversation is a weird conversation because like David doesn't know what's going like. He's the king, right? But they basically want to tell you that David did a little research in what was going on. He wanted to make sure. The whole conversation is weird, too, because they say, oh, we, there's this guy, Ziba. So they call Ziba, and he goes, are you Ziba? He goes, yeah, I'm Ziba. Like, what kind of conversation is that? Like, you don't usually get that. Like, that's not necessary information unless somebody is really there at the time. They want to tell you that they really found Ziba, the right Ziba. And... Ziba is part, was part of Saul's inner circle. He knows what's going on. He knows the people. He knows the parties involved. And he says, yes, there is this son of Jonathan whose feet are crippled. So he loved Jonathan. It says, you know, I got to do this for Jonathan. I got to do something right for Saul's family because of Jonathan. This is, it doesn't say for Saul, but because of Jonathan. So here's what he said. Where is he? The king asked. And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodavar. King David had him brought from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodavar. And when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, he flung himself on his face and prostrated himself. David said, Mephibosheth, and he replied, at your service, sir. So, Mephibosheth gets brought he's he's up in the north which makes sense uh, the descendant of saul would be up in the north and not in the area of judah but in the area here it says he's up in the menasha territory so they bring him and um by the way it says they had him brought which means they didn't call him and say hey would you come down you know they didn't send a messenger they sent some people to bring him down which is different than you know, I sent him a message and I asked him to come. So he throws himself down in front of him, obviously humbling himself, obviously saying, what, what can I do for you, king? I'm your servant. Which is another way of saying, I'm, what does the King James say, by the way, Mary, there? <coughs> the reverence. Okay. Same kind of idea, but the idea is, again, he's humbling himself before him. David said to him, don't be afraid, for I will keep faith with you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will give you back all the land of your grandfather, Saul. Moreover, you shall always eat at my table. Mephibosheth prostrated himself again and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog like me. The king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I give to your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and to his entire family. You and your sons and your slaves shall farm the land for him and shall bring in its yield to provide food for your master's grandson to live on. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 slaves. Mm -hmm. 
it seems to be kind of a very strikingly, um, you know, very detailed description of what was going on with Ziba. Um, and he says to Ziba, you know, look, this is, this is Mephi Bochette's. You guys can work on it you can farm it. It's your property. You can get the food from it. You can live off of it. You can take care of you too. Don't worry. But Mephi Bochette actually gets to eat at my table. He gets to be with my, my family. It's with my family, which is a pretty, it's a pretty generous thing to do for Mephi Bochette. Now look, he's not really worried about Mephi Bochette because Mephi Bochette is differently abled. He's not worried about him becoming king. How is he differently abled? He is crippled, is the word that they use. What's the King James not politically correct translation? They don't hold back. King James didn't care. Uh, lay him on his feet. Um, yeah, I mean, this translation wouldn't be what we would use today anyways. But, um, and again, here, the translation they use for him is crippled, whose feet are crippled. Um, so he's going to take care of him. By the way, we want to point out that uh, clearly, a dead dog is not a good thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that all dogs were not looked upon highly, but they don't seem to ever be talked about well. And a dead dog is like the lowest thing that you could have. Is it? I mean, it's not a it's not a compliment. He calls himself a dead dog. He says, "What am I? I'm a dead dog." But you have regard for me. So he's definitely humbling himself before David. He feels like you know, again, he could be wiped out pretty easily. Um, but, you know, David's going to take care of him. David's actually going to have him eat his, at his table. And what does he say to him? Ziba said to the king, your servant will do just as my lord the king has commanded him. Mephibosheth shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Mika, and all the members of Ziba's household worked for Mephibosheth. Yeah, so here's the weird thing, is the Bible actually tells us, yeah, Mephibosheth might have not been able to be king, but he had a son, and his son's name is Mika, and Mika is Saul's great-grandson, and he could have been king, because he is part of that dynasty. He's still part of that line. Could have been. There, Mephibosheth might have not been able to walk, but he was able to procreate. So there is still a threat, perhaps, from this line, this line of Saul. So it does tell us that. It tells us that, gives us that information. Could have happened. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate regularly at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Yeah, um... They seem to say that a lot, in case you forgot. <laughs> he told us three times in this chapter that he's lame in his feet. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it's a slightly different word that they use here, I, th I think. Let me just see this one, this one time it said... Uh, yeah, the first time it said Miche Raglayim, and that's what it said the first time. And the next time it said, um, um, no. It just says Pesach, which is like the word Pesach, that he was lame in both of his feet. Um, I don't know. Point is, he can never be king, and he's no threat to David, and he's humbled himself in front of David, and so David is not worried about him. 
So we are going to read this last uh, chapter. This I last part. Also, the priests had to be perfect. Yeah, priests had to be perfect. The king had to be perfect. But not, not rabbis. Well, the rabbis don't have any ritual that they do that would invalidate them from from that. Um, yeah, there's nothing that they had to had, have to do that that would. They're, they're not. Their kids don't get to become. There's not like a sense of you know genetic problem that right. their kids don't necessarily become rabbis they're 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 not doing any rituals for god that they have to be in better shape so as long as their minds were functioning there definitely were issues of their behavior and their and their you know that kind of stuff and validating them to some extent or their attitudes so recently that, that was true for christian priesthood as well but what perfect. perfect yeah yeah oh yeah Oh yeah, no. This was based on the Torah. I mean, it was. I mean, it was also based on what we know about other cultures anthropologically that you know wanted to have people that were in good physical condition to do their but sacrifices. That, that more traditional culture would take people who who were different. Yeah, who were blind or who blind had, yeah. or officials or fits or. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who had weird, weird, or, uh, you know, not weird, but, you know, like they, they looked at those things that we would say, yeah, a bit like things that we would say, well, how would that, you know, and definitely by the biblical standard would be not acceptable. And no issue. So <clears throat> we're going to go right up to the story of, of Batsheva. So no Batsheva. I knew there wouldn't be Batsheva today. We're going to get right up to it. And, um, we do not have class next week, actually. So I want to let people know I will be at a conference next week and uh, actually have to do a presentation at 10 o'clock. So we, I, I, I would be able to do it virtually, except for the fact that I actually have to do a presentation at 10. So um, we're going to read this weird story, which gets back to the, the vassals and to the having to pay tribute. And this is what we're going to finish with today. So two weeks from now, the beginning of May, we're going to come back and read the story about Shema, which you don't want to miss. Crazy story. So here's chapter 10. And this is the story, as we said about, uh, as I said, about tribute. And what happens when it goes sideways? Here we go. Sometime afterward, the king of Ammon died and his son Hanun succeeded him as king. David said, I will keep faith with Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father kept faith with me. He sent his courtiers with a message of condolence to him over his father. But when David's courtiers came to the land of Ammon. Pause. I am I, pausing. No, wait, I mean, that's, it's still part of the same sentence. That's why there's a comma. Because the next idea is contained with it. But I want to just look what happened here. The king of Ammon dies. His name was Nachash. It doesn't say that there, but it says it in this next line. We read about him. He was one of the kings that was there when David first became king. Uh, Nachash is an interesting name because it means snake. That doesn't seem to be a bad thing because Nachash was friends with him. Hanun, who's the son of Nachash, Hanun ben Nachash. Hanun is a Hebrew word. It means Hanun is like Yochanan. It means grace. It's a Hebrew word. So you can see that the Ammonites spoke a language very similar on virtually, you know, almost the dialect different to Hebrew. Uh, and so when, when uh, Nachash dies, David sends courtiers to give condolence message from the king, from the king that is really in control, King David. So he's, he's doing the courteous, nice thing to do to one of his vassals. But, but tells us things are not going to go, go right. The Ammonite officials said to their Lord Hanan, do you think David is really honoring your father just because he sent you men with condolences? Why, David has sent his courtiers to you to explore and spy out the city and to overthrow it. Yeah, so this isn't condolence message. This is spy mission. David is trying to figure out what's going on in this kingdom. So you can see the Ammonite officials, the Ammonite, uh, um, 
his his uh, his his advisors are giving him, as you can see, some not very good advice. They're not advising him very nicely. So what does Hanun do to these to our ambassadors? So Hanun seized David's courtiers, clipped off one side of their beards, and cut away half of their garments at the buttocks and sent them off. When David was told of it, he dispatched men to meet them for the men were greatly embarrassed. And the king gave orders, stop in Jericho until your beards grow back, then you can return. Yeah, I guess get a new set of clothes too. But they humiliated them. They humiliated David's ambassadors, David's emissaries. David was trying to do the right thing. And here the Ammonites go and make a fool of them. Uh, and David, so David is, well, let's see what David, David, first of all, is concerned with his people. He doesn't want them to be embarrassed. So he says, you guys, you guys chill out in Jericho for a little bit, get, you know, get your beards back. So you don't look weird when you come back home. I mean, that's a couple months or so to let that hair grow back out. But uh, yeah, you don't have to come back and you shouldn't be humiliated when you, when you're there, which means I guess a beard was pretty important back then. The Ammonites realized that they had incurred the wrath of David. So the Ammonites sent agents and hired Arameans of Beth Rehob and Arameans of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, the king of Makah with 1,000 men and 12,000 men from Tob. On learning this, David sent out Yoav and the whole army, including the professional fighters. Yeah, so, so, uh there's a little bit of a rebellion going on in David's territories. And again, it's, 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 it's started by not a change in his leadership and, you know, but a change in the other, one of the other leaders dying. And one of the other, you know, the next generation said, I don't need to pay this tribute. You know, you know, so these guys go to war and he gets other people to go to war with him. He gets the Arameans, the people in the further North Aram. And he also gets this other place, Makkah, which is inside, you know, the kind of the territory uh, we're talking about here of, of the north and the and the east, and Tob, which is also in that area around the Golan Heights. Uh, so these are either Canaanites, Syrians, you know, Arameans, uh, Ammonites, people who are in common cause, and they don't want to deal with David. They don't want to pay tribute to him. They don't. They don't want to. They don't want a, a solid rule in, in the land of Israel. So it says that David goes off and David sends out Yoav with the whole army, it says, including the professional fighters. The including is kind of in brackets, but Kol Tseva HaGaburim is like, and, the, and like the professional guys or the heroes. I mean, Giburim are little heroes. But it's like, you know, the, 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 the tough guys. These are, the, this is a big army. Uh, I don't know why he wouldn't have sent out. I mean, like, I don't know why I would say including. I mean, that'd be like the first people you think you'd send out would be the Marines. It's almost like saying, we sent the Marines, we sent the army and the Marines. Well, you sent the Marines first and then you sent the army. So it doesn't exactly make sense from that standpoint, at least the way they translated it. But I don't think you have to translate it. That. David heard about it and he sent Yoav with the whole, uh, with the whole army of, I, I would actually have said with the whole professional army. Um, Does that include the mercenaries? Yeah, well, I'm not even sure it's not just the mercenaries. So uh, the problem is, is the word ha, the word the and is on both. So it says, including the whole, the, the army, the professional fighters. I don't think it would have to be, that's why including this brackets because it's not there i would actually have translated the whole army of professional fighters uh because also colts if the hay here isn't there it would just be the whole professional or the whole army of of stalwarts or whatever they try what did they translate to king james that's a better translation because it has more of the idea of I don't say mighty men, but giburim, or you know, it's the word we use for hero, but it's also like 
you know, these are guys who are going to get the job done. That's the way I would translate it. It's not even the army. It's the Marines. You know, I'm going to send it these guys that are there fighting all the time. It's not even a good analogy, the Marines. It's, it's, a, it's the army as opposed to the militia and people who, who normally only want to go up when they have to. They don't want to go up. Anyways, uh, and that's what happens in Israel today, because Israel has a reserve army, which is everyone who's already served in their military service, and the army that's currently fighting right now. You only call up the reserves if you're fighting for your life. That's why I'd look at it. You didn't have to, this is not half a malicious situation. He's going out, he's fighting with his best soldiers, his professional soldiers. So here's what happens when they fight. The Ammonites marched out and took up their battle position at the entrance of the gate while the Aramaeans of Zobah and Rehob and the men of Tob and Makkah took their stand separately in the open. Yoav saw that there was a battle line against him, both front and rear. So he made a selection from all the picked men of Israel and arrayed them against the Aramaeans. And the rest of the troops he put under the command of his brother Abishai and arrayed them against the Ammonites. Yeah, so it shows how he goes into battle. Uh, and who he uses, including his brother, Avishai. Now, uh, yeah, there seems to be a, a Yud missing here, but that's, you know, that's not that important. But um, yeah, he's going to war against them, and he actually splits his armies into an army that's going to fight the Arameans, and then a, 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 a garrison, or a, a, I mean, a, a, a battalion, that's going to go against the Ammonites. Uh, so he splits them up. So Yoav. Um, I mean, it seems to be a pretty detailed battle, battle plan. So here's what happens. Yoav said, if the Arameans prove too strong for me, you come to my aid. And if the Ammonites prove too strong for you, I will come to your aid. Let us be strong and resolute for the sake of our people and the land of our God, and the Lord will do what he deems right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Yoav and uh, Avishai basically say, you know, look, if, if one of us needs help, we'll go fight with, with or vice versa, right? And it says, Chazak v'nit Chazek. Sometimes we have Chazak v'amatz, which is be strong and be courageous. Here it's be strong and be strong. Uh, and and it's a you know it's a great line. Let us be strong for the sake of our people and the land, you know, of our God, right? Let God be with us. You know? So here's what happens. Yoav and the troops with him marched into battle against the Arameans, who fled before him. And when the Ammonites saw that the Arameans had fled, they fled before Abishai and withdrew into the city. So Yoav broke off the attack against the Ammonites and went to Jerusalem. Yeah, well, that's kind of weird. Yeah. It's like Yoav basically says, ah, there's nothing else to do here now. I'm done. Like, because because the, they, they both flee. When, they, when, one see, when the Ammonites see the Arameans and flee, they flee too. So everyone's fleeing. All their enemies are fleeing. And, um, and it says that he went back to Jerusalem. When the Arameans saw that they had been routed by Israel, they regrouped their forces. Hadadezer sent for and brought out the Arameans from across the Euphrates. They came to Halam, led by Shavak, Hadadezer's army commander. David was informed of it. He assembled all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and came to Halam. The Arameans drew up their forces against David and attacked him. But the Arameans were put to flight by Israel. David killed 700 Aramean charioteers and 40,000 horsemen. He also struck down Shavak, Hadadezer's army commander, who died there. Yeah, so it seems as though the Arameans decided to take advantage of this situation where there seemed to be a, you know, a lull in the fighting. And then they bring in other Aramean forces from further north from Syria. And they join in with the other Arameans. So it says here, that again, what the Torah says, that Hadadezer took advantage of the fact the Ammonites had gone to basically say, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to go to war against, uh, we're going to go to war against them now. Um, 
And it's a big army now that's coming up against them. It's not just the Ammonites and, and part of Aram, but, but now this other group comes down from further north. And uh, this time when David goes into battle, it says he assembled all Israel. So this does seem to now be like not calling up the professional soldiers, but the militia, the reserves, you know, the rest of the people, the rest of the guys who can, who can fight if they need to. And so this is a big fight. This is a big, a big war, which again, seems as though it started as a little war and started out as a situation where, you know, the Ammonites disrespected David's emissaries and then the, you know, Arameans join in and then it becomes a bigger, wider war. So it seems like one of these situations of, you know, what happens in war sometimes where one battle leads to another battle that's much bigger. And again, you know, this is what we're wondering about right now in Ukraine, right now. I mean, we're wondering right now, does this become a larger battle where other, where other countries get involved? Um, and does this war, you know, spill over into, you know, into nearby, in, in, you know, into nearby countries? So, uh, you know, it's difficult to say, you know, it's not exact analogy to Russia and Ukraine right now, but this definitely does seem to be a situation where, you know, we, we are seeing what happens when we're trying to keep something not to, to spill over into the, into a wider region and to, you know, to try to, to do it. I mean, again, the analogy doesn't really work well because, you know, if anything, the, 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 the Russians would be King David in this analogy. Um, but it, it doesn't really work. It's not, it's not the same situation, but you have a situation where, you know, uh, a country is humiliated, they, they do something, and then they winds up getting into be a, but, a much bigger uh, battle. And so this, is, this turns it into be a major victory for King David, not one that he necessarily, a fight that he even asked for. He didn't ask for this fight. And when all the vassal kings of Hadadezer saw that they had been routed by Israel, they submitted to Israel and became their vassals. And the Arameans were afraid to help the Ammonites anymore. So that's the key. So uh, the Arameans decide we're not fighting for, the, for them anymore. This whole thing blew out of proportion. It didn't do well for us. And we're not going to do it. And again, I mean, I guess if you use that, that analogy would basically be that the United States comes to Ukraine's aid and then they decide we're not going to fight for you. I mean, you know, that, that would be kind of the, the, the uh, analogy if it happened where, 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 you know, we basically say, well, we're not going to fight for them anymore. So um, there is that, there is that, and we have had those before. I mean, that's more of a Vietnam situation, if you will, where you say, well, we're not going to fight for those people anymore. They can't be relied on, you know, they're, they're not a, they're not going to fight, you know, they're going to retreat, whatever. So um, it's a, it's a, um, it turns out to be another great victory for David. So um, when we come back, uh, we are going to, in two weeks, we're going to read about uh, David and Bathsheba. And the background of that story is David's fighting and David's battles. And that David seems to always win. He doesn't, he doesn't have a problem when he goes into battle but he has to fight all the time. And that becomes an issue for mm -hmm. David's legacy is that David, as we will read, is told by God, you have too much blood on your hands. You can never build the temple because you have too much blood on your hands. Mm -hmm. At first he's not told that. Yeah. And David has, um, even though it seems like David hasn't always asked for these battles, he didn't ask for this fight. He didn't, he didn't think when he sent these emissaries to, to, to the Ammonites, he didn't think it was going to cause another battle that would eventually bring in the Arameans. And again, the Arameans, it's, I want to make it really clear. David never defeated all of the Arameans. He defeated Hadadezer. He defeated some of them. He defeated the southern Aramean kingdoms. He didn't defeat the, He never defeated all the Arameans. He, did, he didn't. He, he, he killed... He killed it says he killed uh, Hadadezer's forces. He killed a lot of their soldiers. 
you know. Uh, so it's not, it's not a, they don't go away. The Arameans are too powerful. I mean, the important thing is, is that the Arameans that were based in Damascus, they're more powerful. I mean, we don't know that they're more powerful than David, but they're not, they're not going to be routed by David. They're, David doesn't go to war against them. They go back home and they say, we're not going to fight for, we're not going to fight for the Ammonites anymore. That's their fight. We're too far away, whatever. We're not going to get involved with David. He's too powerful. He's too successful. We're not going to fight with him anymore. But this is something that David has to deal with, at least during his lifetime, is that he always has these people popping up that he has to go to war against. He has to go to war against the Philistines. He has to go to war against the Ammonites. He has to go to war against, he had to go to war for some reason against the Moabites. He had to go to war against the Edomites. He has to go to war against these people, and he has to put them in his place, in their place. Now, Solomon, his son, doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to put them in their place because David, his father, did so we will come back in a couple of weeks and see what happens when David is on one of those campaigns or on one, when his armies are on one of those campaigns. Because as you noticed, even though it says that David killed um, right here, it says that David killed 700 Aramean charioteers, charioteers and 40,000 horsemen. David didn't kill them. We don't know that, you know, we don't know that David was, you know, even fighting in this. It doesn't say David fought in any of these battles. It actually says that David sent Yoav, you know, out into battle. It says that, you know, uh, he assembled. Well, here it says he assembled, so. We don't know that David was in battle, but it could be. He could have been in that battle. I want to show you one other thing that's really funny that I just saw um, before we go. So we do have class tomorrow night, and we have class next Wednesday, but we don't have next Tuesday. Um, I got to show you this thing that just made me, and we saw that Chazak. Uh, I just saw this thing on a humor site, but it's not, it's not, was not a, um, it wasn't, this isn't made up. Oh, yeah, here it is. Here's the story. Sorry. Okay, so this was on BuzzFeed a few years ago. Let's see if the picture is still there. Yeah, here it is. I'm going to show you. So, so I got to show you this. So, um, so here I'm going to show you this. So one of the things that's become popular now is Hebrew tattoos for people who don't know Hebrew. So um, he was in a war. This guy, Shruli Shochet, was in an Arkansas Walmart. We ran into a guy probably showing off his tattoo that he thought read strength in Hebrew. Unfortunately, the tattoo was badly misspelled. So this guy had the word matzah on his tat on his arm. He thought he was getting the word amatz tattooed on his, which means courage. Like we say, Chazakva Amatz. So Amatz means courage. And there are people who have the word Amatz. I think you should get that tattoo, oh, Rabbi, because I know how much you love Matzah. Yeah. That's yeah. Matzah. It's not Matzah. Yeah. So, he says it means strength, just like my name. I got it while I was in the military. We didn't have the heart to tell him. <laughs> His tattoo actually <laughs> Matzah. Well, it's kind of funny because he has the Hebrew word for tracker. <laughs> and he's from Arkansas. So, so, he said, so, so he said he had the word matzah on his, his arm. I, just, I saw somebody else said, like, this is this has become legend, this tattoo. But there was something funny where somebody said, um, yeah. He has the wrong word, but it does take a lot of courage to eat masas. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess the guy, I don't know if anyone's ever told him because it doesn't seem like these guys told him that he had the word. <laughs> I want to, I want to share this with Sarah. Can you post it or something? Uh, I, I, uh, here, 
I'll 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 put it up. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll, put it, I'll put it in the Cheryl, chat. Right Cheryl, here. Uh, it's I thought that would be a little Passover, a little Passover humor, but um, yeah. but it is. It's the Chazak Vamatz, which is what the Israel military's uh, that's the Israel military's uh, call is, like uh, like uh, what's what is the uh, Semper Fi. So yeah. it, in Israel, it's it's uh, it's Chazak Vamas, be strong and be courageous. It's from it's it, for those who remember, it's from Joshua. It's from the book of Joshua. So Chazak Vamas. Hey Rabbi, if you put that on your arm, I'll pay for so it. So close, <laughs> you were so close to the right word, but you just it was one letter off. It's one letter off. That's what happens when you get a tattoo and you don't speak the language. By the way, how many people are walking around with? tattoos i i have heard of this too that people had like sanskrit tattoos and stuff like that and they didn't know what, what was tattooed or they had chinese characters tattooed on them and it was qu quite you know off a little bit and someone from china says you know that's not what you think it says <laughs> <laughs> but i don't know if anyone's i don't know if anyone's <laughs> Any as good as matzo, you cracker. All right, everybody. <laughs> Enjoy your matzo. We'll see you next week. Two, two weeks on Tuesday or Wednesday, tomorrow night, okay. next Wednesday. Take care, everybody. Happy Passover. <laughs>